Welcome back, friends. Today we're talking about uh, parsers, the, really the practical sides of it. So last time I told you what a grammar was, the formal definition of a language. I told you what a language was, which is a set of sentences. And we explained the role of our grammar formalism, which goes from a notation, the, from the notation, the description of grammar, into the language. So exactly what sentences are, are allowed in the language. And we illustrated this with the example of JSON. Uh, so we saw the JSON grammar and some examples and different notations also for this grammar. Today, we're talking about parser more specifically. And parser are related to grammars, but they're very different. So the grammar, as we said, is a description of the language. The parser is a program, it's something that runs on your computer. And the parser has two tasks. One, it first, it must decide if the sentence, so the input it receives, belongs to the language or not. And if you have a parser that just does this, it's not a really a parser, but we can call that a recognizer. So it just says yes or no when it's given some input. Yes, it belongs to language. No, it does not belong to language. As you can see, this is very related to grammar because that's all a grammar does. It describes a language. Now, a parser does a second thing that is very important. It extracts the syntax tree uh, for, the, for, the, for the input. Okay, so we did see some tree before, but we're going to explain more in depth what a syntax tree is. So a parser is a program that runs and extracts a tree. A parsing tool is something that lets you create parsers. So broadly speaking, there are two kinds of parsing tools. There are parser generators. And what um, characterizes a parser generator is that it outputs a parser program. And typically, it will output source code, which then you have to compile uh, using your language of choice. Often, this is going to be a command line tool. You give it um, some grammar, which is defined using uh, the own grammar language for the tool. You give it the, the grammar, and it generates a program or a source code. That's typically how it works. So to give you some example, the most famous tool in this category is called Yak or Bison. Um, and we're going to see the theory that on, outlines these tools much later in the course. So that's a parser generator. The other kind of tool is a parsing library. So parsing library is my own term. There is no, I think, widely agreed upon term for, for these kind of tools. But their main characteristic is that they let you interpret a grammar. So they do not generate code which you have to uh, compile or uh, link to your program in some way. Instead, the library runs inside your program and it will uh, interpret the grammar as your own program runs. So it's a, it's a library, right? And typically, the grammar will also not be defined with a, uh, a specific language. Typically, it will be language DSL. It will be defined with a DSL. Well, a DSL is a domain-specific language. Often, that's used to mean that you use uh, your programming language. So it could be Java, Python, Ruby to define something that's going to be interpreted. So in this case, the thing we're defining is a grammar, and we're going to use Java to define the grammar. So you see that they use the word typically a lot. These are generalization, OK? So the really important thing is, the really important distinction is between this here and, and this here which is that the parser generator outputs some code and uh, the parsing library lets you interpret the grammar. Uh, in theory, you could have a parsing library that takes uh, its, own, its own grammar language and then interprets it. Or uh, you could have a parser generator that works with a DSL. Actually, I know some tools that do that. So these are just generalization, uh, but the important thing is underlined. Okay. so. To further explain 
or give an example of how these different kinds of tools work. Here we have a parser generator. It takes a grammar as an input. Uh, so the way the way this diagram works is that basically um, everything that is uh, that's a box, a solid box, is a program. So you see here the parser generator is a program that receives a grammar and it outputs a parser, which is again a program or at least source code. Uh, the other convention using this diagram is that the, the thing with the graffiti boxes are inputs and outputs. And so then you're going to make your own program, your compiler. Oh, I've just written some program because it could be something else. And here you're going to take some output input. You're going to pass it to the parser and you're going to get an EST that you're going to use in your program. Um, if you use a parsing library, on the other hand, you're going to um, take a grammar and take an input and give it the parsing library. But here you see the parsing library is inside the program. And you're going to see that you use in your program directly. So the big difference is this is inside the, the box and this is outside this box right here. Uh, also, this, this diagram at the bottom, like the input could be in there, the grammar could be in there. That, that's actually more common. Like if you use a DSL to define the grammar, then inside your program, you're going to be defining the grammar uh, inside here. Just some illustration to make the point clear. Um, so there is a common abuse of language where parsing tools are often called parsers. This is acceptable, let's not be pedantic, but if you want to be precise, the parsing tools create and run parsers. Uh, the parser is the thing that you are making using the parsing tool. Uh, interestingly, for the context of this course, a parsing tool is a compiler, right? The, the language is the grammar notation that you're using. And then we have a code generation phase or an interpretation phase, depending on the kind of parsing tool that you are using. And the language can also be a domain specific language. So I put a, a interesting ocean mark there because it depends how you depend or you define domain specific languages. But the classical definition is to oppose it with general purpose languages. So a general purpose language is a Turing complete language, which you can use to do any kind of general thing. So uh, Java, Ruby, Python, JavaScript, C, whatever. Those are general purpose languages. Uh, the main specific languages could be grammars, but it could also be like HTML, JSON, XML, uh, any kind of data definition language. SQL is a very famous domain specific language. So in that sense, uh, parsing tools are in compiler and they are compiled for domain specific languages. Which, which shows that really uh, it's not just about general purpose language, it's also about these small languages that are, uh, they can be incredibly useful in their context. Okay, so earlier in the course, I told you we generated syntax tree and then I said these are typically called abstract syntax tree. And I also told you I will explain to you what's the difference. Well, this is now. So to explain syntax tree, we're going to take the JSON example. So we have the peg notation grammar here and we have an example input. To make it easier, we are going to go to the BNF notation. So I told you it makes things easier and you're going to see why uh, for syntax trees. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you the syntax tree for this. It's this whole mess. Okay, so what we're parsing is an object. Um, the object has pairs. There's actually a spelling mistake is s missing here um which you know they're actually pairs so it has a pair child uh which has a child pair and t pairs the convention that we're using in this tree is that there is one node in the tree for each non-terminal that's what syntax tree means it means we follow the structure of the grammar and we transcribe it into the tree because that's the only thing we can do, you know, that's the only way we know the structure. The grammar is the only information that we have. 
And so we do indeed this, so we get, you know, pairs is defined as pair t pairs. So indeed, uh, we have a pair, we have a t pair. And if you look at pair, it's a string literal and a value. Well, indeed, a string literal, a value. Uh, nothing here is very unexpected. It's a bit ugly, though. I mean, look at this tree, and this tree is not even complete, right? I didn't represent this here, is this whole part here. So actually, the most, the biggest part of the ST is not even present because it's so cumbersome. And if you look at this, you don't immediately think of this, right? This is much clearer. Um, so let's look now at the abstract syntax tree. So what really we would like to have as a tree. So see here, we have an object and the object has two pairs. One pair is version 17, one pair is bundle, it contains an array, which contains four objects. This is much more clear. Uh, also, it can represent the, the bottom of the tree, but it's pretty clear what's going on. So the difference here is that if we go back, we can see that we got rid of all this all this mess here. Pair, pairs, t pairs. We just values, we got rid of all of that. Because I just know it. We don't care about that. Now to be fair, if you have a parsing tool that uses a grammar notation that does support this kind of notation, you know, like uh, stars and uh, interrogation mark for optionality. Typically, these tools will let you generate better syntax tree. Okay, it will not force you to have all this math here. Uh, and will let you generate something that is much, much more like this. But abstract syntax tree, beyond this, there's another uh, meaning to it, which is that you, you control it. You decide what goes into the tree, what becomes a node, and what doesn't. And it can be a lot of work, okay, to define this, because it means that for every single rule, well, not these rules, but more like for each of these rules, you need to define how to uh, get the node, which can be a lot of work. But sometimes you really need that uh, because it simplifies your life later. It's actually not a lot of work, it's just annoying because you just have uh, a lot of verbosity from defining it. It's, it's usually fairly straightforward to define. So I have a, a really practical example from a grammar I've wrote myself. So I wrote a grammar from the Java language. And in Java, you have lambda expressions to express function, okay? So this is a, a lambda that just prints its argument and this is a lambda that just sum its arguments. Uh, we have, you know, lambda, whether it's this or that, is going to be a single type of node in the tree. But we're also going to have a node for the parameters, right? And you can see that there's two ways to define the parameters, actually more. But here we only show two ways. You can define just a single identifier, then you don't need parentheses, or you can define two identifiers or, or you know, three or how many as, as much as you want. And then you do need parentheses. These need to be defined by different syntax rules. Okay. And so what you would normally get if you use a syntax tree, not an abstract syntax tree, is that you would get this version here on the left with a single, uh, call this node a single lambda parameter, just x, or a multi-lambda parameter, which is a list, and x and y. Now, what you need to remember is that parsing is just the start of the compiler. Later in the compiler, we need to check the AST to see if uh, it's typed correctly, if um, restrictions are being violated. It, this is the semantic analysis step. And then we need to transform this tree into a bytecode, or we need to interpret it. And so we're going to work with this tree a whole lot, and we would like it to be easy to work with. And if we have this kind of mess here with these two types of nodes, it means that every single feature in the compiler that has to deal with lambda, now it needs to deal with two different kinds of lambda parameters. This is annoying. It's, it's more work down the line. 
what we would like really is to have the same kind of uh, of node and for them to have a uniform representation. So you see here now, instead of uh, the single one, it is uh, the same lambda parameter and also as a list. And now I can uh, I can treat these lambda parameters exactly the same way after parsing. And this is why you need abstract syntax tree. They abstract from the actual syntax, you know, the, the fact that uh, parentheses are used is a purely syntactic detail that we want to abstract to only leave the, the meaning, which is there are parameters. Wh what are they, you know? Okay. And that's it for now. Um, so next time we're gonna do something exciting. I'm going to show you how you can write a parser by hand and, and we'll see that it's less wizardry that it might seem at first. Okay, take care and see you next time.